Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you guys. I'm sorry that to hear that Dennis is not feeling well, so please let him know I say hi. Um, today's topic is going to be bites and stings. Um, a lot of it will be familiar to you, but to kind of put it in a different perspective and also to discuss the Poison Control Center, how we can help. On the table here, I have some snakes display and some handouts flyers and pens and also some magnets to take home. At the end, you can visit the table. Again, I am Dr. Duger. I'm the healthcare educator at the Poison Control Center. We are located at Tampa General Hospital. I've been uh, with them for seven years, so it's my pleasure to talk to you guys. The first thing on our list is going to be your bees, wasp, um, those that can sting us. And remember, when bees um, sting you, they leave behind the stinger. So the main thing is it's filled with that little sack of poison. So we have to find a way to safely remove it so it doesn't continue to um, hurt. And a lot of people do apply ice, and a lot of people have to go to the, to the emergency room if they have um, an allergic reaction. But because it leaves behind the stinger that's attached to the venom sack, we tell people don't try to pull it out. Because when you pull it out, what you do, you squeeze that sack and release more venom. So try to find something blunt, like a credit card, your driver's license, or um, a coin, something blunt that can just flicker it out. You'll see people do that a lot. And then wash the area with some soap and water. The reason we say that is to not have a secondary infection. So if you had anything um, dirty on your skin and here you are, something sting you, if you don't clean it, you can end up with a secondary infection or a staph infection. So allergic reaction is the greatest thing um, we want to make, make sure people think of. You don't have to be allergic from the time you were a kid. You can become allergic to bee venom later in life. So we've seen that happen. Um, the toxic response also when there is a large number of bees, like if somebody got attacked by like an um, Africanized bee or uh, they just went into an area they didn't know there was uh, a nest there. So if you have more five to 10 stings per pound, of your body weight, that can be lethal. A lot of people don't know that. B can kill you depending on the number that attack you. And then, of course, a less severe thing can be an infection. But allergic reaction, some people have anaphylactic reaction, which can be fatal about 30 minutes or so. So the main thing if someone is allergic is to get help right away, is to call 911. If you have an EpiPen, give it to them and until help arrives because we know that it can be fatal. Yes. Benadryl is a help, but not for anaphylactic reaction. Because anaphylactic reaction, what it's going to do is going to close your throat because you're swelling, you're releasing a lot of mast cells. So that's going to lead to a life-threatening situation. But somebody that have like some type of swelling in their arm after getting, can get Benadryl for some mild reaction. Other thing people do, they apply ice or they make a paste with baking soda and water. They put it over that for 15 to 20 minutes. But keep in mind, this is only for a mild reaction, not for anaphylactic, not if you are allergic. Um, sometimes you might have to take some acetaminophen, some Tylenol, something for the pain, but only if you're not allergic. Allergic reaction needs to be taken to the emergency room. Yes. So if, if someone gets severely stung and you're taking them in an emergency room, it is not, uh, and you're worried about them going into anaphylactic shock, it's not good to give them Benadryl or that is okay while you're taking them? You should not take them personally. You should call 911 because the EMS, they have protocol for anaphylactic reaction. They can treat doing transport. Oh, sure, 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 yes. Sure. So do, anytime someone is allergic, it's to call 911. I, I understand. But yes. Even if you're in the woods, you're still going to try to get them closer, but still call for help. Because, I agree. Yes. Saying that. So avoid the Benadryl or use the Benadryl? The Benadryl is not going to help at that moment. So avoid. Yes. It's the main thing is to get them. If you have an EpiPen, sure. if you have an EpiPen, you want to give it right away. Okay. Yes. An epinephrine. 
Um, symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction, to know what you're looking at, is it's going to start swelling. I don't mean like a little swelling. It's going to be a large area. They're going to start breaking out into hives. They will start having symptoms of um, hypotension, some dizziness, some nausea and vomiting. And some people might go into wheezing. That's when we know that the throat is closing. That's telling us we really need help right away. So if you do have an EpiPen, you, you, you can administer it. Um, have you guys ever seen one, um, an EpiPen? Okay, okay, yes. So if somebody know they're allergic, always carry that because that can save your life. Um, if it's a massive envenomation, meaning that multiple bees you got attack, some people like mowing the lawn, if you have those ground bees, you go over it, that sound can make them come out. Or if you're cutting a tree, you didn't know there was a hive there, you have a lot of at, um, bees attack you at once, call 911. Somebody who's allergic, have an anaphylactic reaction, you want to call 911. The goal is to get help right away. Next thing um, we'll talk about are those stinking caterpillars. Um, we are in Florida, they are everywhere. Um, I see you guys have some oak trees, they love oak trees. Um, during the spring, you're going to start seeing them. This, um, the ones here are the saddleback caterpillars and then the post caterpillar. We have others. Um, there is the hag or the flannel moth. They look like a little fur ball. Um, the, one, the, the issue with those is that all those little spines, the little hair in their body have the poison in them. So if you rub against it, sometimes you find them on your car, don't use your hands to flicker them off because they, that's how people um, get stung. So use something to pull them out. So when that releases into your skin, and people who've gotten into them tell you that this is the worst pain of their life, it's really intense pain for about two weeks. So be mindful. There is the IO caterpillar and the spinal oak slug caterpillar. Um, we have multiple, and they, we call them all stinging caterpillars because the little hairy part of their body can get into your skin and cause pain. So if that happens, um, know that you're going to have burning, itching, and a rash will develop. Do not rub the area. It makes it worse. You release more mass, mass cells. Um, so remove the tiny spines as if you were giving yourself a wax. So if you have something that you can put on the skin and kind of quickly pull it out, so that's going to quickly remove them from your skin. And then call the poison control center from, for help. Uh, or if you're in a lot of pain, go to the nearest hospital because we know people can be allergic and we review the sign of allergic reaction. It's going to be the same thing, the fresh skin, the hives, and breathing difficulties. So that's when you would want to call 911. Um, the next topic is going to be fire ants. We, th we will be talking about fire ants in the presentation. They are here. Um, if you've ever got, gone over them and you're getting um, those blisters, it's no fun. It's very itchy. And many people end up with a secondary skin infection because they scratch it so much. Um, you can end up with a staph infection. The reason... Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I, um, I heard that with fire ants, the more you get bit, the more worse it gets. Yes, and what they do, they inject formic acid in, into your skin. So when they bite you, that's what's causing that um, really fluid-filled pocket you get and the itchiness. So the more you scratch it, and that's what can lead to that infection. And a lot of people end up with, like, some people are, can be allergic. They have, like, welts that develop from it. But most people will have just those red um, bumps like you see on his legs. About two weeks or so, it's going to take to heal. But when you're itching, that seems like a long time because it takes a while. Um, fire ants first aid. Some people will use like calamine lotion for like a symptomatic relief. It helps with the itchiness because we don't want you to scratch it. The more you scratch it, the itchier it gets and then that's when the infection can develop. And then you can call the poison control center for help. Um, of course, if you're allergic, some people are. It's not as common as a bee um, allergy. But this, it does happen. If you're having some type of um, symptom of an anaphylactic reaction, go to the nearest hospital. Um, we're going to continue with spiders, uh, the next one on our list. And this one here, the black widow spider. Ever, anybody ever seen them in real life? Yes, yes. Um, you know that our hourglass is on the ventral part of it. Some people think it's in the back. Unless you kind of see it from up high, you may not see the, the reddish. And it's not always red. It can be orange. Some of them can be like a burnt yellow. But most commonly, it will be red. 
So the black widow spider, when it, you, you, you get um, bitten by it, about an hour or three hours, you're going to start having pain. It's like it builds up pain. Some people describe it as like you turning on the pain faucet. Meaning that it's like it intensify over time and it can last about 48 hours. Symptoms can be dizziness, pain in the abdomen, cramps, swelling, um, sweating, headache, and weakness and difficulty breathing. So we know it's severe pain, so that has to be treated as well. Um, the next spider here is the black widow spider. You can see here it's not as red. It's still a black widow spider. It's not as red as the previous one, right? So remember I said they can be orange, they can be bright yellow or red. So it's to know that there is some variety. Um, the first aid for that is some people use some cool compress for symptomatic relief. Of course, we call the poison control center. And if allergic, again here, we want them to go to the emergency room. Go ahead. Yes, you can. Yes, you can if you don't get the proper care and if you're allergic. If you're not allergic to pain, is what you're going to be dealing with. Yes. Um, have you, anybody seen this one, brown recluse? Yes. They're not. They're not native to Florida, but they are here. Um, if you look at the map of the United States, they're supposed to be in the western part of the state. But we've had cases here, and you know they can hitchhike, they can get on those luggages, those um, trailers that are coming to Florida. The way to know it is a brown recluse, you see that violent shape on the back, like a fetal um, back? That's what tells us it's a, that we have some brown um, spiders here in Florida that looks like it, but unless it has that, that, that shape where it looks like it has a violin on its back, um, it's not a brown recluse. Um, before we go to snakes, um, know that the brown recluse spider is different than the black widow. What it does, it creates like a, a crater. When it bites you, the tissue is dying in the inside. So when you go to the hospital, they have to scrape and remove all that. So people end up with a necrotizing fasciitis, we call it, where the tissue is die dying inside, so they have to do a debridement. So that's how we know it is a brown recluse because the bite is totally different than the, the, the black widow. So whenever you have that bull's eye where it's getting ugly and it's making that circular shape, we know that it is a brown recluse. So that has to be treated in the hospital where they remove all the dead tissue and treat you. So a lot of people will end up with a scar, um, a deep tissue scar um, because of that. Yes? Those are bites and not stings then, right? Um, the spiders, we like to say bite uh, because of the way they do it. It's kind of different than if you look at um, the bee, for example. It doesn't really inject. And any, any bite, spider can bite, by the way. Um, it's only those two that are, we're dealing with venom. So we have multiple spiders. Um, we do get a lot of spider bites during the winter months. Um, the reason for that is that people might have a jacket or blankets stored away for several months. And then it's cold. We know Florida is very temperamental. It's cold one morning or one night. People just pull, take them and put them on and did not know that they had spiders in them. So we tell people, whenever the weather is changing, if you know you're going to need those things, give them a good wash, run them in the dryer, just to be sure, because that's how it happens. So this is the ones that I know you guys really want to see. It's going to be the snakes. If you do have any snake phobia, I have full disclosure. There is a lot of pictures, and I'm sure you guys don't because you wouldn't be sitting here looking at them. So know that any snake can bite. Most species of snakes in Florida are non-venomous. Only six of them are. And we're going to discuss the ones that are. It's going to be your eastern coral snake. That's the last one we'll discuss. We have the cottonmouth, which is also known as water moccasin. Eastern diamondback rattlesnake, the pygmy rattlesnake, the cane break rattlesnake, and the copperhead. So let's go. Um, those snakes we discussed except the coral snake, which is the little one, the little guy over there, um, they're all part of the pit vipers. Um, they have common characteristics. We can identify them by some facial features. They have the heat sensing, the pit, 
But to know that or to see that, you have to get up close and personal with that snake to see all those facial features. And we don't want people to do that. As you can see on that one here, if you get pretty close, you can see all the little definitions. So the pit vipers again, are you gonna be your Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake, your pygmy, cottonmouth, which is the water moccasin, the cane break, and the copperhead. So, okay, that was out of space. Um, snake bites in Florida. Um, in, in the US, we have about 45,000 bites every year. Not all of them are venomous, about 7,000 to 8,000 are venomous. 25% of those venomous bites are dry bites, meaning that a venomous snake can bite you and it did not inject venom. So 25% of the time that can happen, meaning 75% of the time it will inject it, so know that. About five fatality a year, so we've gotten better at treating it, so we're saving lives, uh, but still five too many. So we need people to know that so we can save those lives. And many bites are still not reported. Um, the majority of death um, occurs because of the eastern and re western um, rattlesnake. As you can see here, this is a huge snake, right? So if it's going to inject venom, I mean, it can give you a good loading dose of venom. Um, and we have higher incidence in children. As you know, kids are curious. They want to see what this snake is. They might try to pick it up. Um, we do have with some older adults, and a lot of issue that happen with snake bites is delay and getting help. Sometimes people watch it. They try to treat it at home. That's what leads to those problems. Um, adolescent males are known to get bitten and not tell people. So we want to tell our, our, our young adults or young males to it's okay to go get help. 28% um, of bites are associated with alcohol intoxication. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> and most bites occur in our extremities. So again, here we're walking in the woods, whatever is nearby, that's what they're gonna get a good bite at. And most bites occur between April and September, so your spring is coming, be mindful. And then most of them's gonna be in the southern, um, western part of the United States. So if you live in the Midwest, you don't have to worry much about that. In the eastern part of this, the, the country now. Yes? Explain why it's that most of them are dry bites. Um, 25 percent are dry bites. So the snake goal is to warn you, right? Tell you I'm bad, stay away. So they, sometimes they strike to get you to be out. They, they're not trying to hurt you. So when they do that, they don't automatically um, inject it. Um, one thing that a lot of people say that, that has not been tested is that they say that the more mature the snake, the less likely it inject because it has a lot of skills, ways, things that it can use to keep you out. But the babies, the little ones, the juveniles, they say that you come near them, they give you everything they got. So how true is that? I don't know. But it's just to know that 25% of the time, they don't inject venom. Because they say that they know that you're not food. So yes, they don't want to waste. They don't want to waste it on, yes. on something that they're not going to kill. Kill, exactly. Yes, go ahead. Until you get to the hospital, you're not going to know it's a dry bite. Oh, okay. So you have to go to the hospital. I'll tell you how we tell later on. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, those are the kind of breakdown by state. This is um, up to date here. You see we're not the most prevalent. We have about 350. Um, if you're in Texas, watch out. Um, if you are in California, you still have to pay attention. Yes, yes. So we like the fourth highest. So snakes in, um, in the U.S., we have about 120 species of snakes um, that are indigenous to the United States. 20 species total, that's in the U.S., that's venomous. For us in Florida, it's only six. And I have a flyer here that's going to show you which ones are in Florida. So the majority of them are going to be the pit vipers. 99% um, of venomous bites are going to be those guys. Um, they can be found um, in every state except Alaska, Maine, Hawaii. Maine? Is that Maine? No. Hmm. So cold there. <laughs> yes. 
So you either get bitten or you go in a place that's very cold. So you pick your, your bottle here. Um, those are the venomous snakes here in Florida. Six of them are venomous. 44 is not, so we got a lot to choose from. Um, those are the venomous snakes in Florida. That's the Eastern Diamondback, the Pygmy Rattle, the Canebrake or Timber, the Copperhead, Cottonmouth or Water Moccasin, and then the Coal Snake. Remember, the Coal Snake is by itself, so those five other guys are the Pit Vipers, and then the Coal Snake. But we're going to discuss them one by one. Um, quarter lids, which is the pit vipers, we identify them as you can see this one here. They have a large triangular head. Um, they have heat sensing pits. Remember, you have to be close to see those. Um, really, they have the elliptical pupil. Um, they have fangs. Um, the water moccasin has a white buccal mucosa. You'll see a picture of it later on. Um, a lot of time, you'll open it up to kind of scare people off. And they have a single row of subuco scale, and then they have the rattle um, scale at the end. Um, again, here that's some differentiation to see the venomous versus non-venomous snakes. So venomous snakes have the head, large triangular head, and then they have all those other um, features that I described, the elliptical pupil, the heat sensing pit, and then where the venom is located, if you look on the side. The non-venomous snakes, they can still have a large head, but the shape is different. It's more round or elongated. Um, and then again, they don't have the rattle. Yes? Sorry, I, um, I heard that uh, hog noses are venomous, but they don't have the rattle. Which one? Hog noses. Not, never heard of that. There's a there's a research debate about that, and different people are writing different papers on that it. So it's under discussion because there's been some people that have had certain bites from certain snakes that seemed like they had venomous reactions. I, I'm not giving an opinion. Okay. This is What's being been discussed in the um, scientific literature right now. Okay. 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 Sorry, I thought I was wondering what was wrong. Let's go back and work it somewhere. Okay. No. Um, this one is the Eastern Diamond Back Rattlesnake. As you can see, it has a diamond shape throughout that runs all over the spine. And if you look at the head, again, you can see the large triangular head comparing to the neck, which is very small comparing um, to other snakes. Um, this is the one that's the largest venomous snakes in the United States. It is the most dangerous snake in the state of Florida. Um, the name tells us really what it does. It does have the rattle at the end. And then you can find it in a lot of pine, flatwoods, sand, pine, or shrub area. Uh, really know that the rattle is a bunch of loosely connected, um, dry, horny scale. That's what makes that buzzing sound when they shake it or vibrate it. Um, the next one is still the cotyledons. That's the copper head. The color kind of give it away. Um, we'll see more pictures of it. As you can see here, it has that blotchy but copper throughout um, the body. It's light brown to gray with some reddish brown bands. Um, you can see, find it a lot of uh, river beds or wetlands, um, but we don't find it in, in South Florida. So it's more of a northern part of the state. Um, so really uh, from the Panhandle um, west of Tallahassee all the way to the App Appalachian River. Um, this is the pygmy rattle um, that you can see different pictures of it, how it can get that dark color, but you do see have that orange band all around. Um, the pygmy rattle is, has a small rattle, and in a lot of times that's a very small snake comparing to its cousins or the diamondback or things like that. Um, really, it hangs out fresh water, so a lot of fresh water body can have venomous snakes um, there. But around the back, you can see that orange line that goes all through and then the blotches all around it. That's how you can identify it. Um, the cane break again still have that light line all around, but um, characteristic for this one, some people develop a lot of a large rhabdomyolysis, which is tissue damage. Um, they have to do fasciotomy where they cut it. If you don't get help right away, that's the snake bite that leads to they have to cut and open, and people it can get pretty ugly. 
And those people, for some reason, they don't swell as much. They do have a lot of subcutaneous thing happening, but they don't swell on the surface a lot. And if you can imagine, if you somebody wants to tough it up, you may not see much swelling. You might think, okay, I'm good. I'm going to weigh it out. But then a lot of tissue damage is taking place underneath it all. Um, the timber rattlesnake, um, it's large, it's heavy bodied. Um, it does have the large black chevron cross bend down that pinkish gray or tan body. Um, it really is limited to about 12 counties in the northern part of the state. That doesn't mean you will not find it here, but it's not common, um, but mostly in the northern part of the, the state. This is the cotton mouth I said earlier that has that fibrous tissue in the mouth. Um, we also call it water moccasin. Um, the color can vary. If it's an adult, it tends to be like a jet black dark color. And a lot of people can mistakenly for the racers. Um, the adults get very black. But look at the babies. They can be very light. Um, they can look like a tannish color. Some people might think they're not venomous. So the darker the color, the more mature is the snake. But the babies come out very light color comparing to the so, um, so older ones. The, when like that? the head is different right. than the it's racer. Right. Yes. The racer, remember, is going to have like a, a, like a round, elongated head. That's different. And they also uh, found that near, near freshwater, a lot of lakes um, will have them. And some people do say that they are very mean. Um, we've had cases where people say they actually chase you. Yeah. Oh, so. Do they really chase you? That's when you make a U turn, you go somewhere else, you know, just let it go on its own way. Maybe it was trying to go a mile away. Um, really, venom is complex. So the mixture that it's released can also lead to the tissue damage we see. Um, it all affects a lot of your blood vessels, a lot of nerve damage. That's why we have to treat right away to prevent those long-term effects. Symptoms can be mild to severe. Um, not everybody's gonna present the same way. So if anybody get bitten by a snake, they need to be seen. So that way we can uh, really differentiate the two. Uh, within minutes, envenomation can lead to swelling. Um, not always, some of them more than others. But what we found that minutes to an hour, we're gonna start having some coagulopathy, which means that your ability to clot is gonna be affected. So some people will present with some sim symptoms, um, systemic symptoms, tingling, um, they can start having edema. Uh, other people can just have more like localized symptoms. But know that I said 25% of the time they're going to be dry bites, so those people are not going to have all those major symptoms, but you may not know that until you go to the emergency room. Now, and Go ahead. Can they tell by just the bite what kind of snake it was? Or, I mean, a lot of times they tell you to try to identify it so they can... You know, no, can't we can't. We can't tell what it's not. Um, if, it's, if somebody says it's a coral snake, um, and it's a bite that's bleeding, that's swelling, and we can see huge fang. We know it's not a coral snake because that's a very small snake. But anything else, you cannot tell. No. And any wound, anytime something, I mean, pierce your skin, it's going to swell. It's going to, it's a wound. So that's why even those 25% of the time, we still have to see the patient to tell the difference. So systemic symptoms, you know when a snake, they don't chew, right? They, when they're gonna eat, they release enzymes that digest their prey and that's how they eat. So when that happens, subcutaneously, that's what's happening to you. You have a lot of tissue damage and people will have systemic symptoms and have the, the vomiting, the pain, and abdominal pain. And some people can go into blurry vision and even diaphoresis, meaning that their blood pressure is dropping, they're sweating a lot. So all that can happen. And neurologic uh, cord symptoms gonna de develop and some people will have seizure as well. And a lot of people can progress to having acute um, cardiac arrest, uh, cardiomyopathy, as a result of an envenomation. So, know the clinical diagnosis is done by looking at the patient. 
we do some tests, we measure, we look for coagulopathy, but externally it's going to swell, it's going to bleed, but patients going to start having some systemic symptoms because subcutaneously all that is taking place is damaging your tissue. The one with the asterisks are the most common presenting symptoms, so people will have the fan marks, we can see them in them, they will swell, they will have pain, they will be light lightheaded because there is some fluid shift that's taking place, a lot of vasodilation, and ecchymosis meaning that it's swelling and releasing a lot of um, coagulopathy is going to happen. And then everything else can still happen, but those are the most common symptoms. So what we do when a patient come in, we assess them initially. So as soon as you get into the emergency room, what we're going to do, we're going to mark right away, get that number one, where the bite occurs. So if your finger marks are right here, we're gonna mark over that. We'll put the time of arrival, and then we measure it. Then we'll start getting your labs. The reason why we do that, we're gonna differentiate, is it dry bite or envenomation? If it's a dry bite, it's still gonna swell, but we look for progressive swelling. Meaning that as we continue to measure, if it's continued to swell and your labs are abnormal, those two things alone tell us there is venom on board. But if you came in, it was swollen, and I measure your labs are normal, it's not progressively swelling, it just stays where it is or swell a little bit, that kind of make me single that it is a dry bite, but we're not gonna assume, we're gonna repeat your labs, we're gonna continue to measure, then that repeated labs might need to be confirmed again, then we know, okay, there is no venom on board. If it's continue to swell and your labs continue to be abnormal, then now we need to treat you, we need to give you antivenom. So that's how we know if it's a dry bite versus a, 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 a envenomation. So that's why the person by themselves would not be able to tell the difference. Um, so if it's a dry bite, we monitor you for about eight hours or so because we don't want to miss something, right? Some people have delay uh, in swelling, so we keep you in the hospital. Some people get bored, give you something to read, watch TV. Let's make sure that it's not going to be a delayed presentation. So when it is a, uh, confirmed, we just cl clean the wound, treat the wound, and let you go home. But if it's still um, swelling and your labs are abnormal, me meaning that your coagulopathy is showing up in your labs, then we know that there is something we need to give you venom, anti-venom for. Now, yes. Sorry, I keep asking. That's okay. Um, so what happens if they don't know what snake bit them? How do you know what antivenom to do? The good thing is, because we only have six snakes in Florida that's venomous, and remember I said it's a group of snakes and then one. So this guy, the coral snake, we treat it differently. The other five is the same treatment. Oh. So, and we're going to be able to tell it's not a coral snake because coral snakes are so small, sometimes you really have to look for the mark and they don't give all those lab abnormality. So if your labs are abnormal, I know it's not a cold snake. So the treatment protocol is pretty um, self-explanatory. I mean, somebody can say it was a brightly colored snake as opposed to like Yes, bingo, yeah, you got it, yes, yes. Have you ever had a case where you had someone bit both by a viper and a coral snake at the same time? No, okay. no. That's that person would have to have both at home and because the, they, a lot of those snakes are territorial, so they don't hang out together. Unless we take them out of their natural habitat and put them like in a zoo, that could happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we tell people things to avoid doing when you get a snake bite. Everything you learn in Scout, or you see in those older movies, don't do. No cutting, no sucking the venom, no ice, no pen reliever no cutting of the area, no alcohol, no blood products, no electricity, no steroids, no tourniquets. So then what do you do? Because we said no, 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 no. So let's see what do you do. We tell people if it's swelling when you get home, let's say that it was a dry bite, we sent you home and it starts swelling, come back. That's what you need to do. If you're still in the hospital, we're gonna continue to monitor you but then before you get to the hospital then what do we do all those things that they do in the back in the day we notice that it makes the outcome worse for patients because when you tie it you blocking circulation and when you remove that tourniquet it's just gush all over to your to your heart go ahead um, shock, electricity? I've, I've never heard of yes uh, 
you know those little zapping things they use for pain? Like the TENS unit? Yes. People have experimented with that. For some reason, they believe that is going to limit the spread of the venom by keep on zapping on that area and keep it, and it does not. If anything, it increases permeability. It makes the, the, the venom absorb even more. And same with the alcohol. People think that if they pour alcohol over it, that's going to help. No, it does not. Um, this is the, the anti-venom here that we use um, to treat if it's an actual bite. Uh, for the first one um, is the cofab. We've had that for several years. What happened when you get to the hospital? Remember, we measure, we check your labs, we repeat it. When we confirm it's a bite that has venom, we're going to give you four to six vials of this antivenom. It's called cofab. While we do that, we're going to repeat your lab. The four to six vials, I give it to you right away to get some control to stop the swelling from progressing and normalize your labs. So if it continues to swell when we repeat that about an hour, your lab's still abnormal, I can repeat that loading four to six vials. But if it stops progressing and I have some control, we're going to do some maintenance. We give you two vials at six, eight, and 12, 18 hours. So we mention that until we can transfer you to a different floor or monitor you for about 24 hours before we send you home. Um, the next one here is the elapid. That's the coral snake, right? It's small. It does not have a big smell. If you see the nature, some of them are at the size of a pencil. They're very small. They're kind of shy. They try to stay away from people. They're not as aggressive as those that's going to stand their territory. They try to run away from you. But then we do get people um, that get bitten because they try to either kill them or try to handle them. So um, this is the snake here. You can see that it has a black nose and the red and the, color, the, the, the yellow, the way the bands are, it's like you have a red, two yellow bands. Um, if you remember in Scott, we say red, Touch yellow. kill a fellow, red on black, venom black. But when you're in the midst of it, you forget all of this, right? Mm -hmm. So we tell people, if you can just tell us it's a very colorful snake, there are things we can do to know that if it was a um, cold snake because the venom is going to affect your body. Yes? I'm not sure about the South American, but the ones in the United States, I will use the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. But look what late nature is trying to do. It's trying to fool you. Look at a lookalike here. The scarlet kick snake versus the coral snake. The scarlet is not venomous. The coral is. Um, really, the colors are the same, but the pattern is different. And then one has that black nose, the other one does not. So really, it's, it, it, it can be tricky for somebody to know which one is which. And then there is that one here um, that's in Arizona. It is still a coral snake, but it's more of a white band in between the red. Some of it can be light yellow. So what the coral snake does, unlike the other snakes, it's a neurotoxin. So when it bites and injects the venom, you're going to start having some neurotoxicity where you're going to have affecting your cranial nerves. So patients might start presenting with some drooping of the eyelid where they can't open it. And if the person smells like alcohol or they were drinking, they can open their eyes. You're talking to them, they're slurring their speech. And you're only human. You might think that they are drunk. You may not know that they got bitten by a snake. There is not a lot of bleeding. There is not a lot of swelling. If the patient cannot really tell you, that has happened in the past where people... They smell like alcohol? Let's say that they were drinking, right? They were outside drinking. They got bitten by a snake. The symptoms mimic like if somebody's drunk because it's a neurotoxin. So we tell people, let us know what's going on right away so we can treat you. And what's going to happen, it's a race against time for this one, because if a neurotoxin is affecting you, eventually it's going to decrease and get to right here and paralyze your, your, your nerves and your muscles. A lot of people can die that way. So once we know it's a cold snake, we're going to treat right away. And really, we don't do no cutting. We don't do no labs. 
We don't do no measurement for this one. We treat. This is the antivenom for it. Um, we were not making it for the longest. We start making it again. And what we do, we give those people uh, four to five vials of that. We don't do any maintenance, no measurement, none of that. We give it to them right away. Uh, the main thing to, keep, to remember is that as we talk about those snakes, all the others, we group them together as the pit vipers, we treat them together. This one, we treat it separately. So it's like we have two, two snakes in reality. Is the large group ones, the pit vipers, and then the core snake. Um, and also know that most bites are not venomous, they're not that dangerous. Any snake can bite. Uh, scarlet can bite, eraser, it doesn't matter what it is. And it can still swell because anything that puncture you, hit your arm, it's gonna swell. That doesn't mean that it's venom. So we have to check. And we tell people if you're going out and about, wear protective gear, some boots, clothes, I mean, close to shoe, something to protect you. And then if you get bitten, those, we all have those in our hands. Snap a picture if you can, if it's safe to do so. I mean, if you're already getting beaten, you might as well just, what's the worst that can happen? It already bit you, take a picture so when you get to the hospital, they know what happened here. Um, some people try to take the snake, put in a jar, put in a pillowcase, don't. The nurses and doctors are not snake handlers. And, and we tell people, teach children, don't touch. Kids are curious. In the core snake specifically, we've had several cases here in Florida where a cat bring them in, they're so colorful. Some small children think they are necklaces or they think they're cute. They pick them up, get bitten in the hand. So tell kids, it doesn't matter what snake, never touch a snake or spider or caterpillar. That might be a good thing because that's gonna make a difference in their life. And then also be careful. After a hurricane, we have fallen branches, we're cutting, we're cleaning, a lot of mud and water. Snakes can be displaced. So we tell people be careful if you're cleaning or you're removing debris like around the spring, we're gonna do some spring cleaning. Be mindful because they are here. They go do a pretty good job at hiding, but they still are here. And also, if anything that bite or sting, we're gonna have some swelling and redness. So it may also be itchy or painful. So that's not a good way to differentiate anything. Because anything can hurt or swell and things like that. So when you do have a snake bite, so this is what we do need to remember here. If you have a ring, remove it. If it's bitten in your hands, you're gonna swell. So whatever you do when you're preparing for that swelling, you remove your rings, your, your bracelets, your watch, that way you don't have anything constricted. If you have a long sleeve, remove that, so that way you don't want anything blocking that. Keep the area at below heart level, don't elevate it. We don't want to put that venom in circulation until we get to the hospital. Clean it with soap and water, if you can. Um, do not apply a tourniquet or ice, because that's going to make the damage worse. Do not cut it, do not try to suck the venom. You're gonna call the Poison Control Center at 1-800-222-1222, or you're gonna to go to the nearest hospital. Um, now, I would not do you a good job if I did not talk about the Poison Control Center. I'm biased, I work for them, but I believe in what they do. So let's talk a little bit about the Poison Control Center. Get to know it and know what service you can get from them. Um, first, know that we talk about snake, we talk about bites and stings, which is injection, things that pierces your skin, but there are multiple ways you can get poison. You can inhale something, you can ingest it, we put things in our mouth, it can absorb to your skin. So any of those ways can lead to poisoning. So people get poison in all four ways, but the most common way is ingestion. So we put things in our mouth and ingest something that's the most common way we can get poison. Look at the calls we got from 2023. A lot of people say, oh, poison control's for children. My kids are grown, I don't need poison control. Look at what the data is showing here. It tells you that anybody can get poison. Yes, we do get calls for small children, but we also get calls for 20 to 64, over 65, 6 to 12. Anybody can get poison here. And then most of the calls are coming from home. 
Um, 27% of the calls are coming from hospitals, meaning that doctors and nurses are calling the poison control center to help them take care of their patients. So all that is done to the poison hotline, so the public can call, healthcare professionals can call 1-800-222-1222. Let's talk about what this is. This is a national helpline or national hotline. Um, it's the same number wherever you are in the United States or territories. Uh, wherever you're traveling, you would call the same number. You will be connected to your nearest poison control center. It's 24-7 and it's free. Even if somebody doesn't speak English, we do have interpretation. And we follow up on everyone. You call us, we take care of you. We call you back to make sure you're still okay. And we do keep data by helping us identify trends or do surveillance. And everything is due free of charge. You never have to pay for that. When I say free, it's not free to you and then you pay for your insurance. No, it's free, no insurance, nothing involved. But you don't go there, though. You go to the emergency room. You go to the emergency room. Good job, yes. The Poison Control Center is there to reduce the incidence of poisoning cases. And they can do that by talking about poison hazards like we're doing today. They can promote preventive measures. They can help you if something happens. If you have an emergency or if you have questions, you don't have to have emergency to call. You can do that. And we also do surveillance. Um, in the country, we have 55 poison control centers. Not every state have their own. So Rhode Island share with Massachusetts is a small state. Um, the US Virgin Island is served by Jacksonville. Hawaii is served by Colorado. But wherever you are, you are still covered. Large states like us in Florida, we have three. Texas has, I think, four. Um, New York and California, they have more than one. We are all certified by an accrediting body, just like your hospitals. And we are funded at the state and federal level. For us in Florida, 20% of our funding come from the federal government, 80% from the state. So that's why we're able to give you everything we do free of charge, whether you want flyers, you call, or you need any services, we do it free of charge. Um, this is us here in Florida, um, the one in Tampa where I work. We are Tampa General Hospital. We were the first one in the country. We opened in 1982. As the state grew in size, we have one in T Jacksonville, one in Miami. We really divide the state by population. So the smaller um, area, like the green, is Miami because it's so densely populated. The upper, the red area is Jacksonville. They have less um, really people in those regions, they're more remote regions, so they have a more larger territory. Um, who answers the call when you call? You're going to talk to a doctor like myself, a nurse, or a pharmacist. It's never going to be an operator. It's never going to, going to be a volunteer who just answers. It's going to be a clinician who's able to help you, and that's 24-7. doesn't matter if it's a storm, a hurricane, the middle of the night, you call that number, you're going to get help. What they do when they're triaging the call to see if they can take care of you at home, or do they need to send you to the emergency room? And when they, if they tell you to go to the emergency room, they also call the hospital and help the treating team because remember I said 27% of the calls come from the hospital. So the hospital call us, we help them. We are a specialty. So if you have a heart problem, you're gonna call a cardiologist, right? So we are toxicology, so anything poison related, that's our field. The only difference is between us and other specialty, we are free. So who, who can call? That includes like, like kids drinking um, bleach or whatever. Anything, yes, yes. Who can call? Anyone can call. A parent, a grandparent, a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, anybody, doesn't matter who it is, they can call the poison control. Um, reason to call, you can call if you have an emergency or if you need information. You, if you have questions, you can call as well. So we don't, you don't have to have something happen to call, but you can call for something that happened. Um, when you call us, 85% um, of the time we can take care of you of, at home. Like let's say you're at home, something happened, we're able to treat at home and let you know what to do, and then we call back to check on you. At the hospital, it's more of an ongoing conversation. We take care of the patient, and then we do labs, we continue to take care of them. And then if the person is not doing well, you can always call us back as well. So when you call, what we do in really kind of guide that conversation when a healthcare provider call us, we let them know what signs and symptoms to look out for. We identify if it's a group of symptoms, we call that toxidrome. We tell them what, what 
treatment to give the patient. If we have antidotes, we tell them, we don't just tell them give that antidote, we give them the dose for that patient. We also guide for antivenom, so we're very specific for that one patient when they call us. And then we continue to talk to them whether we order labs or we tell them to do decontamination. We're gonna continue to take care of you in the hospital until you go home. And then after you go home, we'll call back and check on you. Um, the difference between us and 911, you might wonder. Um, 911, if it's, you need somebody to come on scene, we don't go on the scene. We do everything over the phone. So if somebody cannot breathe, somebody pass out, somebody's bleeding profusely, somebody's having an anaphylactic reaction, they need someone to come to them. So you would still call 911. If anything else, that's the poison control center. So that's the difference. Any poison, any time, you would call the poison control center. <laughs>